Hello and welcome to this Asia Scotland Institute video cast with Lord Stephen Green, Baron Green of Hurstpier Point. This interview will explore Lord Green's recent book, The Human Odyssey, East West and the Search for Universal Values in the context of the current coronavirus pandemic. The book recognises the long human odyssey of self-discovery has reached a crucial stage. Everything we do affects everyone and everything else, and we know it. The next hundred years will bring more change than we can easily imagine, more opportunities for more people to achieve the fulfilment of a good life and more risks that could result in a catastrophic harm to the entire planet. Viewed geopolitically, the main question is whether the world views of the world's most important and influential powers, China and America, the one fundamentally Confucian, the other essentially individualist, can be made to work together constructively. At the same time, on a deeper level, the even greater question is how the irreversible fact of urbanisation may nurture healthy and mature human individuality, such that the accumulated wisdom of the world's great cultures becomes mutually transforming and enriching. This bold and wide ranging book explores those questions with all the risks and opportunities they hold for generations still to come. Stephen, um, we are absolutely delighted to be talking with you today. Uh, Stephen Green, who is the chairman of Asia House, uh, former minister uh, and responsible for trade um, and a great expert on Asia. And Stephen, I wanted to just position our conversation with you today in the context of the very prescient words that you put in, put in your book, The Human Odyssey, about which you came to speak in Scotland last year. And I just wanted to say that, to quote from it, the long human odyssey of self-discovery has now reached a crucial stage. Everything we do affects everyone and everything else, and we know it. The next hundred years will bring more change than we can easily imagine, more opportunities for more people to achieve the fulfillment of a good life, and more risk of catastrophe and harm to the whole planet than we have ever known before. And I would very much like you, in the context of that and your writings, to, to comment on what changes we've seen and what we can expect to see following the current uh, pandemic. Well, uh, Roddy, thank you, and it's great to be back in conversation. I must say that when I wrote those words, and indeed when I was in Scotland uh, talking about the book in the, in the autumn of last year, I certainly did not have in mind uh, that we would so soon experience uh, such a global pandemic and the way in which the very smallest of uh, beings, a virus, can have such a catastrophic impact on the way we live our lives. Um, and it's as if uh, an awful lot of chickens have suddenly come home to roost. Um, people are asking the question, what does this mean for, uh, for uh, humanity in general, for this country in particular, um, for uh, for, for all of so many human endeavours, what does this mean going forward? Uh, I, I, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether we're going to see some new normal that is profoundly different from what we've been used to up until early March. Um, and at one level, I want to say it's too soon to tell. Famously, uh, Zhou Enlai, the uh, Chinese premier in the early days of Mao, uh, most of the, well, all of Mao's career, in fact, the Chinese Premier was once asked about the consequences of the French Revolution, and he replied famously, it's too soon to tell. Well, I, I am inclined to say it is too soon to tell what the impact of all of this will be on all of us. <clears throat> I mean, if you look at the short term, we are getting used to lockdown, um, getting used to a new way of living um, that has taught us all a few things I expect about ourselves and what's really important. Um, it's very hard, um, but of course, as sadly is usually the case, when hardship comes, it's, it has a differential impact. So there are uh, people who are hit very hard indeed, not of course, there are people who fall ill and die. So this is a great tragedy. And then the lockdown experience itself is a very different thing. If you are living in a small apartment in a large, uh, block with no balcony and no easy access to to gardens or any kind of private space outside it's quite another thing 
if you are living in a larger house with a uh, largish garden uh, and a beautiful view. And it's still another thing if you're living in a Calcutta slum. So the experience uh, has not, uh, is in one sense unifying because the disease is no respect for persons, but in another sense, of course, it's not so unifying as all that. Um, then there's the medium term, and then there's the longer term. Like in the medium term, the, the, clearly uh, our government, in company with governments around Europe and elsewhere, are beginning to think about how you exit from the lockdown um, <clears throat> uh, with the peak apparently having passed. And uh, uh, that's going to be a tricky thing. We all know about that. There's been a lot of discussion in recent days, a lot of discussion. And getting the exact prioritization right loosening such that you can minimize the damage to the economy without leading to the famous r if coefficient rising above one uh, we suddenly all become experts in in r coefficients um is going to be very tricky um it's interesting to see that when you look at these stock markets if you take out your uh, um, aerospace um uh, the airlines, the travel industry, hotels, cruise liners, and so forth, uh, and also the banks and the oil companies, the energy companies, you'll find the rest of the market is actually about the same valuation now as it was in January. In other words, it's recovered essentially all of its gain, uh, all of its losses. I find that extraordinary, but if the markets have got it right, it's a comment on how uh, what the world will feel like as we recover from this and as the aftershocks wear off. So I should maybe stop there and see whether, uh, Roddy, you wanted to um, pitch in. Well, thank you, Stephen. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Good. Um, I, I think those are very, very interesting comments. Um, I suppose that what we've seen, and again, it's slightly in the context of, of again, the human odyssey, is the, the vulnerability of cities, you talk of the move from uh, rural to urban, how uh, most people will live in cities by a certain time. And then within those cities, and New York is a very good example, I suppose, and then London to a certain extent, large numbers of people sort of piled literally on top of each other um, creates an environment where disease can spread much more quickly. So that's interesting. So a, sort of a negative aspect of, of urbanization has been the spread of diseases of this sort, not for the first time, of course, as we read in in history, on many occasions, theatres have been shut, people have been told to stay at home, they've put things, that masks on their faces, and, you know, whole communities have been wiped out, actually, in villages and things in rural areas. But the other thing that's happened is that, that uh, on which I'm interested in your view, is that government has become much more, um, I suppose, uh, directive towards people, and there's, there's very, very little to, dif to, to, to um, determine between, to differentiate between a so-called conservative government now and a socialist government, looking at the vast amounts of money being poured into parts of society uh, and, the, and the economy to get them to survive. Are these things, you, do you think, that will stay with us now going forward? Or do you think people will, will create a new normal in smaller communities and, and behave differently towards each other? Well, I think oh, to take those two different points, i.e. urbanisation and the role of government separately, um, I think urbanisation is not going to be uh, rolled back in any significant way by this experience. I mean, the numbers are simply too big. Uh, the human race goes on expanding. Um, there is no sign of it being possible to uh, <clears throat> row back to an earlier era when most people lived in the countryside and indeed got their living off the land. Um, we are, uh, for better or for worse, whether we like it or not, wedded to city existence going forwards. And the fact that this, this virus has exposed some of the vulnerabilities of city life, uh, I, I'm afraid won't change that. Um, it may well encourage what is in any case underway, which is a shift towards more digital connectivity, whether it's in uh, as consumers buying more offline rather than uh, I'm sorry, online <laughs> rather than physically walking into uh, high street shops. Um, it may well encourage more um, inter-office working visual, uh, uh, virtually rather than going physically to meetings because I suspect we've all discovered some, some quite interesting facts, namely that you can have a quite productive office time 
uh, without rushing around from place A to place B to place C, um, uh, as the technology of virtual communication, including virtual communication of quite large numbers of people, gets better and better. Um, so uh, what does that mean in the medium term? I think it means um, that people will go on living for the most part in cities. I think the drift to the cities will continue. Um, it doesn't much further to go in Europe, but if you look at Asia, uh, the average um, uh, percentage of populations living in cities is probably 55% um, and, and has been rising. I have no reason to believe that it won't continue to rise and it will head up to the European level, which is at least 80%. Um, I don't see that trend as having been changed in any significant way by, by COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's too soon to tell what longer term effects on our behavior COVID-19 will have. If you imagine that in a couple of years time, there is a, uh, a vaccine and uh, some prophylactic treatment for those who do catch it, um, I personally think that the most likely thing is that certainly rega as regards leisure travel, uh, we will quite we will gradually move, probably gradually rather than suddenly, but move towards the status quo ante with a lot of people travelling uh, for leisure purposes. I do think business travel may be uh, more subdued for much longer because of the points I've been mentioning. We will have we have been discovering um, the benefits, the efficiency benefits of more virtual working, and as far as the retail industry is concerned, we will continue to see the shift that's already underway from uh, uh, physical distribution to uh, physical purchase, purchasing practices to online. Um, so it's a complicated story. Um, uh, looking much further ahead, um, it is clear that everybody is going to move pandemics up their risk registers. Uh, companies may or may not have had pandemics as high as, as they should have had on their risk registers as they look at supply chain management, for instance. Um, governments will probably, uh, in the, for the most part, not have had pandemics as high a risk as, as that of uh, international terrorism, for example. I suspect that pandemics are going to uh, attract a great deal more attention, both at corporate and at government level, in the coming years. Stephen, thank you. And, I, and, and do you foresee um, upheaval and... Um, major disturbances in certain parts of the world. I'm thinking particularly of, of Asia, where, for example, migrant workers have been trapped uh, and are unable to get home, as in India. Do you think that there will be revolution out of this in certain countries? <clears throat> no, not revolution. I think there's a different geopolitical question, which is how, uh, how this will affect the relationship between America and China, which is so important to us all, um, yep. and where if you listen to the rhetoric, at least from uh, uh, to, to the west of us across the Atlantic um, and coming out of the White House, but not just the White House, um, there's a pretty determined effort to paint China as the, as, as the originator. Um, and in some cases, you even suggest, it's even suggested the deliberate originator of all this chaos. Um, I think that's nonsense. Um, I think it's dangerous nonsense. And I think that the the risk of a breakdown in the relationship between America and China is in some ways the most important risk facing us all. And, um, uh, that, and in some ways is the most, the, most, the biggest um, geopolitical question arising out of all this. Do I think there'll be revolution in any, in any particular um, Asian or other country as a result of, as a direct result of COVID? Not, not particularly. You talk in your book about Confucianism on the one hand and sort of the, the individual uh, on the other in, in Western liberal societies. Um, that, is that manifesting itself in the way in which people will react to this? And as a secondary question, I suppose, Allenson writing about the Thucydides trap, is, is that something that we see happening? China beginning to overtake uh, the United States of America? Um, in a way that historically, I suppose, is not surprising. Well, I think, if I may make two different points in answer to, to that rather important question. First of all, on the Thucydides trap, um, uh, Alison, um, the, the Thucydides trap is a reference to 
uh, an argument that Thucydides, the Greek historian, made that when there's a, an incumbent power and a rising new power, war is inevitable. And he was referring to Sparta and Athens, uh, and Aaron says, tracked other occasions in history down to the present day when the same uh, basic phenomenon of, a, of an incumbent power and a rising new power has led to war and speculated as to whether this may play itself out again. Uh, I, I don't know. I clearly hope not. I think it will be extremely dangerous for us all. And we are in a new era now in the sense we are talking about two global powers, both of whom, by the way, are heavily nuclear armed, um, so that the notion of a catastrophe uh, such as the First World War, which was which would certainly have been uh, presented as one of the evidences for the Thucydides trap, the, the, the incumbent power at that point being Britain and the rising power being Germany. Um, I, uh, whilst there are some uncanny similarities now, um, there, is a, there are some important big differences and the, and the, the state of uh, nuclearization is one of them. So we better hope that it doesn't play out in that way. Um, uh, I do think uh, that in order to minimize the risk of it playing out that way, uh, we need to encourage uh, leadership that's constructive and ready to learn on both sides. It takes two to tango. Um, this is not a simple matter of, uh, of America having to get used to a new rival on the world stage. Um, I think it is a matter of learning from each other about perspectives uh, that jointly can help the world face up to its largest problems. And its largest problem over the next century, by the way, is quite clearly climate change, in which everybody's got a vested interest, whether they acknowledge it or not. And you really do want to see America and China working more constructively together, learning from each other, um, uh, because that's in the interests of us all. And uh, some of the recent behavior patterns of uh, American leadership, of course, not helped this process at all. Um, I wanted to make one other point, uh, and that is about the way in which different major powers have dealt with COVID and what, if anything, that means for their relative strengths on the world stage. It is sometimes argued uh, that a China that has demonstrated its ability to control and apparently eliminate COVID-19, um, we'll see whether that's really true yet, um, but apparently we'll certainly get it under control, but through the use of some pretty uh, stringent social control measures which it would be hard to see being imposed in quite that man manner in, in, in Western countries. Um, it's been argued that that strengthens China and puts it in a very strong, uh, 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 freshly strong position on the world stage. Uh, and that conversely, um, uh, both uh, America and the Europeans are going to be weakened by the experience of grappling with it. I don't buy that argument in quite that form. I do think China um, is getting stronger on the world stage and, and COVID-19 will not have um, set them back in any sense. Um, but I think um, it would be unwise for Europeans to, uh, to underestimate America's intrinsic resilience. Uh, America is famously a society which is inventive, uh, flexible, um, dynamic, uh, and whatever the dysfunctionality of government, uh, there's an underlying drive and determination in American society, which I believe means that it will reinvent itself a lot more quickly than, than, than we expect. That the, and that the, those that lose relatively in influence on the world stage will not be the Americans, it will be the Europeans. And, and Europeans, are, by the way, are, I mean that collectively, including the Brits, um, and perhaps also the Japanese. So I do think what COVID-19 may lead to geopolitically is an increased focus on that fundamental, uh, con uh, uh, I use the word conflict, but at least kind of squaring off against each other between China and America. And the big question is whether that plays itself out constructively or destructively. Stephen, thank you. I'd like to, to end this conversation drawing in perhaps uh, your views on, on humankind. I mean, you are a person who believes in the spiritual and I, and I wonder to what extent you feel that people may treat each other in communities, uh, well, in families, in communities, in cities, in countries, with greater consideration than when we went into this. Whether the, if you like, the milk of human kindness is going to manifest itself in, in a way that wasn't always so apparent in the highly materialistic 
world in which we have been living? Well, I think you've already seen some of that. Um, I, you know, when you think of the UK government calling for to what they hoped would be 250,000 volunteers for for health and social care, and they got 750,000. Yeah. Uh, uh, at home here in London, where I live, uh, on every Thursday evening uh, at eight o'clock, we we stand outside the front door, uh, clapping for the National Health Service and for the social care workers who are on the front line. And it's, it's a very heartwarming experience. And we've done this every Thursday now for the last several weeks. Um, and, and, you know, then there's the famous uh, Captain Tom and, and lots of other stories, great and small, of, of, of humanity showing the milk of human kindness and rising to the challenge of a, uh, of a very common um, uh, uh, shared experience of, of difficulty and danger. Um, I think it's one of the strengths of, of humanity in general and actually of, of, of a liberal and open society in particular that that can be manifest so readily. Now, not perfect and we can all point to some, some individual behaviours of a more selfish nature, of course. That's always going to be true. Uh, that's the nature of humanity. But I think that, um, I think that, 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 that individuality and, that, uh, and by individuality I, did, I distinguish between individuality and individualism, I distinguish in the book between individuality and individualism. Individualism is what the word sounds as that means. It's a selfish me too approach to life and there's been far too much of that around um, of late um, in both Europe and in America and, and, and it rears its head everywhere. There's always a propensity to be individualistic. Individuality for me is that process of maturation where you realize that real fulfillment true human fulfillment depends on recognizing your commonality and shared human experience with others, uh, both in your own, own uh, in your own community and across cultures. Um, and that's where I come back to the importance of the recognition and anything we can do to encourage the, the realization of the need to learn from each other across cultures. You said a little while ago, China, is a Confucian society. I believe that to be a profoundly true point. And, the, and you said um, that the West uh, is much more individual, individualistic. And I think that's certainly true, particularly at the American end of that spectrum. I think there are some important differences between Europeans and Americans, nevertheless. Um, uh, and what both have got to learn is that a true individual self-fulfillment uh, is a kind of recognition of the importance of the individual and of the context within which they achieve fulfillment and the more we can learn that and and we do that by by exploring the riches of each other's cultural backgrounds the more we will learn to respect admire and work with each other in collaborating to deal with the world's great problems of this coming century um, climate change being the greatest one of all Stephen, thank you. And thank you very much for taking this call and for positioning your comments initially in the context of your great book, Human Odyssey, which I hope many people will read because it's very well worth reading. And as I said at the beginning, I think that much of what you wrote um, in that book was very prescient uh, and foretold in, in many ways some of the things and challenges we now face. And uh, I think the great word that we all need to remember as well is redemption, which is at the core of Christianity, which is that, that we need to have forgiveness and redemption and believe that, as you were saying, we can learn from these experiences and move ahead together as a human race. So I hope that we will for the sake of our children and, and grandchildren. So Stephen Green, Lord Green, thank you very much indeed for joining us on this talk uh, for the Asia Scotland Institute. We are most grateful. Thank you. Roddy, thank you. It's a pleasure.